ओके वेलकम टू लेक्चर एट सम ऑफ द पीपल वॉचिंग ऑन यूट्यूब आस्ट अबाउट द सोर्स फॉर द नोट्स सो इट इज द वेबसाइट इज दिस वन आई थिंक यू ऑल नो इट हियर it's a bit of a long name all lower case these are dashes so uh, just uh, i thought i'll put it in the video once so that people know about it so the notes and exercises are available here and with that let's see if there are questions from last time when i introduced gauge theory and uh, then we'll move on so are there questions okay i think last time actually was very simple today we are also going to revise something that in principle you might know but it will tie up a few loose ends and uh, i want you to recall what we learnt about scalars and fermions that if i have a complex scalar or a dirac fermion then i can perform a phase transformation phi goes to e to the i theta phi or psi goes to e to the i theta psi <coughs> sorry where theta is constant <coughs> I, <coughs> i didn't stress this in the last lectures but you can't make theta from depend on x if you do that the the symmetries of the free theory will be destroyed so it has to be constant now <coughs> sorry now corresponding to these we also have conserved currents and i'm sure you have seen them by now j mu phi which is usually written this way <coughs> we can normalize it however we like because it will be conserved anyway so any constant is allowed in principle though the noether prescription will give you a unique answer and there's a conserved current for the dirac case which is simpler in a way just this and both of these are conserved in the free theory if you use the equations of motion then the divergence of these is zero oh by the way i have revised a section in the notes which is on derivation of equations of motion and noether's theorem and try to make it as clear as possible and as explicit as possible so if you have any doubts about how noether's theorem works uh whether we are supposed to use equations of motion when we can use when we can't use everything is explained there so please go and do read that okay this much we know now <clears throat> i'm going to consider a lagrangian in which we have both uh scalars and fermions but also vector fields and what we'll see once we introduce vector fields the gauge fields we'll see that there's a way to promote these transformations from constant theta to thetas which are functions of x arbitrary functions of x and this uh, is known as the gauge principle and it's a very fundamental principle in nature so the entire standard model of particle physics which explains all known microscopic constituents of everything uh depends heavily on the gauge principle and <clears throat> it depends partly on the abelian form of the gauge principle which is what i discussed last time and partly on the non abelian form which i'll be discussing tomorrow okay so what's my claim my claim is that with all of this there is a lagrangian which has a vector field with this free part then it also has a lagrangian for the scalar field uh, you can uh, just to be definite you can always think that this lagrangian is the free one that is the kinetic term and the mass term 
but there could be interactions as long as this symmetry is there could be some potential for example as long as this symmetry is preserved okay so i won't write it out explicitly and then a similar lagrangian for the dirac for a dirac fermion again in my notation i won't say how many of them there are but you can just imagine that there's one or there are 100 it doesn't make any difference to my arguments hmm? <coughs> so really any number there could even be interactions between these two which i won't write explicitly but finally i'll add something new and that uh, will give this lagrangian a new property so what i'm going to add is a coefficient e5 times the vector field times this conserved current for the scalar plus another coefficient e psi times the vector field and the conserved current for the fermion the conserved currents in the normal case are written here if you have some fancy theory which has some more fancy conserved current it's okay you can put that one here but right now just to fix in our minds everything we can just take, take these all to be the free theories and then the conserved currents are what i've written here and i what i've done is to couple the conserved currents to the vector field uh, it's kind of nice idea because conserved currents are vectors vector fields are vectors if i dot them together i get a lorentz scalar so it's something i could add in my lagrangian so why not okay but it will actually give me a very very important outcome <coughs> yes we have simpler vectors in our theory like d mu phi yes so uh, why do we not uh... good point so actually uh, d mu phi might be a conserved current too uh, it's a conserved current in the case of axionic symmetry but uh, for this argument that i'm going to make it has to be a conserved current so yeah if there is axion axionic symmetry you can do that <coughs> okay now what do we already know about this lagrangian well the first term is invariant under the gauge transformations i wrote last time which was uh, now i'll work with the yeah i'm working with the infinitesimal or the finite transformations finite so a mu going to a mu plus if you remember last time we called it lambda today i'll change its name to theta it really doesn't matter what it's called this transformation leaves this invariant we saw this last time it's a very trivial observation these transformations where theta is constant leave these invariant okay <clears throat> now let's see what happens when we add those terms so the claim is that now this full lagrangian is actually invariant under this transformation performed simultaneously with these all of them with the same theta but theta is allowed to be an arbitrary function of x this plus this plus this leaves l invariant there's a small thing i have to correct in this transformation i will include these constants e phi and e psi so it will be e to the i e phi times theta of x and this will be e to the i e psi times theta of x and uh, we'll soon see that e phi and e psi can be interpreted as the electric charge of the scalar and the fermion respectively but first i have to justify the tall claim that this entire set of transformations all made at once with the same <coughs> function theta of x in all places leaves this lagrangian invariant so let's see how that works <coughs> okay well the idea here is that these transformations so this one is fine it leaves this invariant okay and it doesn't act on these two well, these are these don't depend on a now these would have left these invariant only if theta was constant so whatever non invariants there is must be proportional to a derivative of theta such that if theta is constant it goes away okay so we see that delta l phi should be some vector 
म्यू टाइम्स डेल म्यू थीटा इज दिस रीजनिंग क्लियर द रीजनिंग इज डेल्टा एल्फा अंडर दिस ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन इज जीरो वेन थीटा इज कॉन्स्टेंट ओके सो द राइट हैंड साइड ऑफ डेल्टा एल्फा कॉन्ट हैव अ थीटा इन इट बट इट कैन हैव डेरिवेटिव ऑफ थीटा ओके सो एटलीस्ट इट शुड स्टार्ट विद डेल म्यू ऑफ थीटा इट माइट हैव हायर टर्म्स वी डोंट हैव टू वरी अबाउट दोज राइट नाउ ओके बट नाउ द इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग इज दैट दिस को एफिशियंट comes out to be precisely the conserved current of the global symmetry the symmetry where theta was constant and let's see it explicitly <coughs> so we know one lagrangian for l5 del del mu phi star del mu phi minus m squared phi star phi okay now i want to vary this under this transformation With theta being a function of x, what do I get when I do that? So I get first del mu. Then I'm going to do infinitesimal variations. So uh, this transformation, I think I don't need to write for you. Means delta phi is i e phi theta times phi, hmm? and delta phi star is minus of that because the phase is opposite on phi star. so this is actually minus e theta so e phi theta <coughs> phi i'm not going to write function of x everybody is a function of x here okay and this is phi star and then del mu phi plus del mu phi star e so there's an i also i e phi theta Delta. Okay, and then the variation of the mass term, but there's a nice thing of with the mass term that it doesn't really care whether theta is constant or not constant. The mass term is invariant both ways because it just contains phi star phi, so the phase just cancels between the two parts. So I don't need to write anything <coughs> more. So this is it, and if I collect all this, I get precisely. <coughs> Minus e phi j mu phi uh, del mu theta. You can just work it out. So if I don't differentiate theta, if I act with this del mu on phi star, that will cancel a term here where I act with del mu on phi. Okay. If I differentiate theta, then I'll get phi star del mu phi, and from here I'll get phi del mu phi star with a minus sign. and the current that i wrote for you 5 minutes ago is exactly that okay so this is exactly right and now you can see what the job of the gauge field is so this is the variation for non constant theta of this term all right and this proves what i just said i said that it should be proportional to del mu theta and the coefficient should be a conserved current and here it is at least in this example it's true in more complicated examples it's sometimes true sometimes it requires more work so you should be prepared for that at least in the easy example this is true now let's look at this term in this term under a gauge this gauge variation all these variations what happens well psi isn't there in this term so we don't worry about that under the variation of phi you see j depends on phi but j is that bilinear J mu is phi star del mu phi minus del mu phi star phi times i, and if I vary phi with this, even with theta being variable, this thing remains invariant. The reason is when this derivative act, acts on that theta, it multiplies phi star phi and it cancels this term. Okay, so that's how it works. so uh, in fact this is invariant this is j mu phi so this itself is gauge invariant so this is not going to change this is constant the only thing that will change is a and a will change by del mu theta so what will we get e phi a mu sorry e phi j mu del mu theta with a plus sign so what did we get before minus of same thing so they cancel okay it's all spelt out in the notes but i think you can see it by inspection if you try the same thing on psi 
you will find that the variation of this when theta is a function will give you the conserved current j mu psi times del mu theta and then the last term again you will find the conserved current itself is gauge invariant and when you vary a mu you will get a plus del mu theta and they will cancel. So this whole Lagrangian is actually invariant. Uh, this whole thing leaves this whole Lagrangian invariant. So this is very important. So what is the lesson we learn from this? The lesson which is quite general is that when we write Lagrangians for scalars and fermions they typically have invariances like this with constant thetas. We have seen more general versions on model, <coughs> un vector model, matrix models but in all of them that on or un matrix whatever was acting was just made of constants. It was not dependent on space time. Okay. However, uh, <coughs> once theta is variable then actually the vector field itself has a transformation, the gauge transformation which depends on the derivative of theta. If theta was constant, this gauge transformation wouldn't even happen. There would be nothing here because it depends on a derivative of theta. Okay, so making theta variable uh, in these uh, spoils the symmetry that we had previously, but that is restored when we by suitably coupling to A. That's the kind of one-line message. And the last two terms are those terms which we can say restore the symmetry. But the symmetry is now under a variable theta, theta of x. Okay. So this is actually the bigger statement of gauge principle. Last time we saw that gauge principle just says that this f mu nu is invariant under this. And we saw that you can gauge fix and so on. We did Coulomb gauge. But now we see that in a larger system with a scalar and a fermion or many of them, you can compensate for the failure of this, these things to be symmetries by introducing a gauge field and coupling it suitably. When I say suitably, if there was a 2 here or a 3 or an i or a minus, it wouldn't work. I have to couple it exactly right. Okay. So there is a way to couple a gauge field to scalars and fermions to make the whole system gauge invariant. And by gauge invariants, I always mean transformations like this where theta is a function of x. Can it be any function of x? Yes, basically yes except it should fall off at infinity. If it doesn't, we may face trouble eventually. For example, if this theta grows at infinity, then my original conditions on a mu that it falls off at infinity would be violated by adding this term. And all fields in field theory, we should make them fall off at infinity. Otherwise, when we do integration by parts, we can't drop those terms that we get. Then our whole study of equations of motion and everything would sort of fall apart. So if we want all that to work, we must have things that fall off at infinity. So theta also should fall off at infinity. Okay, good. Okay, so we've shown all the things that we wanted. One last thing and then some comments. So now, uh, there's a nice way to interpret this Lagrangian. Let's combine the free kinetic term from this and the term from that and see what how they add up. So the kinetic term was del mu phi star del mu phi. And then that term is plus E phi A mu J mu phi. But J mu phi is with an I phi star del mu phi minus. Right. Now when I add these terms to lowest order in A, to linear order in A, this becomes del mu plus I E phi A mu of phi star del mu minus I E phi A mu on phi. If you look at the <coughs> linear terms in A, in this, they are the same as in that. Okay. There is also a quadratic term here which I did not bring up but which actually needs to be there. But the first lesson of this is that this looks like a generalized kinetic term which I can write as d mu phi star d mu phi where d is a new kind of derivative 
So d mu is the same as del mu minus i e phi a mu. Okay, and this is called a covariant derivative. And it's a very clever term because it has the following job. If I multiply phi with a phase that is space time dependent, then del mu will differentiate that phase and give me an extra term. But a mu will shift by del mu of theta and cancel that extra term. So it's rigged up so that the whole thing is gauge invariant. So now under a gauge transformation, which I've already written, d mu phi simply goes to d mu phi, even though the individual parts don't go back to themselves. So del mu of phi will change. Okay, it was rather, sorry, it goes to e to the i e phi theta d mu phi. So it picks up a phase overall. See, phi picks up a phase, this is x now, theta of x. When phi picks up a phase, d mu of phi picks up the same phase. That's not normal when I differentiate something. If some function picks up a phase and I differentiate it, then the derivative of that function doesn't pick up the same phase because I might differentiate also that phase if the phase is spacetime dependent. But d is cleverly constructed so that e to the i theta, when it acts on phi, it just comes out through d. Okay, and that's the reason to call it covariant derivative. And then we get a Lagrangian like this. You might have seen this Lagrangian in QFT1. I hope you have. Uh, and it has, uh, I know there's a question, but just hold off for one minute. It has some interesting features because it first of all has the term del mu phi star del mu phi, the free term. I just expand out all this. Then I get this term plus E phi A mu J mu phi. And then I also get a new term of order e phi squared a mu a mu phi star phi. Now in field theory, you can see that this term is cubic in the field because there's one a and j is bilinear in phi. So it's an a phi phi coupling. And there's a fine, there's a vertex for that in Feynman diagram expansion. And this is an a a phi phi coupling. So it's a four, it's a quartic coupling. So these are actual couplings. So it's no longer a free theory. While this term initially was just a free theory, by adding this coupling to a current and completing it, I've got a non-free theory, an interacting theory. And now I can justify what I said. E phi is the thing which multiplies J, which brings in a, a phi particle and sends it out after hitting a photon. And that's what we should call the electric charge. So it's correct to call this E phi the electric charge. If you do the same thing with fermions, you'll get a similar term where you get the electric charge of the psi particle, which could be a quark or it could be an electron or a muon. And you won't get this kind of terms. This is special to, both, uh, to scalars, not to fermions. But the important thing is the gauge principle has implied the couplings. And it has implied very specific couplings. We start with this, which is here. We impose the gauge principle. We realize that to impose it, we need some gauge field, so we add that. Then we realize that we need to couple the gauge field to my scalar, so we add that. Okay. Then we realize that altogether it makes the covariant derivative. And then when we expand it out, we find, hey presto, we have got three and four point interactions which were not there before. So it's like a guide on how to build field theories. And notice that here, there's no playing around. For example, the coefficient of this term and this term relative are fixed. You can change E phi. You can put E phi to two E phi, then this will get a four. But you can't keep this term and put a three here. It won't have, won't satisfy gauge principle. Hmm? So there's a correlation between these two terms. With the gauge principle, nature is only allowed to have this when it also has this term. It can't have this and this term with two arbitrary coefficients. 
okay now this is you know uh, looks very grandiose on our part to say what nature is allowed and nature is not allowed i mean nature is doing its own thing without consulting us but the experience gained from studying nature says that the gauge principle actually is the correct set of rules that nature is following so for example the equivalence of these coefficients the fact that this number is square of this number is experimentally verified or can be experimentally verified we'll see that again in yangman's theory so so it took a long time but finally it was uncovered that instead of thinking about nature as a set of fields with any kind of interaction that we might feel like putting in we can constrain the theory to be to have some fixed set of couplings with a few arbitrary parameters not too many uh, by by imposing the gauge principle on it and this seems to be the right way to build theories of nature and uh, this is very important principle which i repeat again and again because it looks on the face of it completely like doing some fancy mathematics and saying well elementary particles should do this that's exactly what happened with yang and mills's discovery which i'll be discussing tomorrow so i'll tell you more about it tomorrow hmm? they proposed some fancier version of exactly what i have written on the board today thinking that it would describe some system in nature which actually was totally wrong it doesn't describe that system what they didn't know is that it describes a much bigger system of all known fundamental interactions namely the weak and strong interactions they were thinking of something actually in a, in a somewhat wrong direction physics wise but their mathematical principle was gauge principle and in fact it was non abelian gauge principle which is like combining these ideas with the mathematics of uh, orthogonal and unitary groups which we discussed earlier in context of scalars and fermions we did vector models principal chiral models they said well you have all those models but in all those models the transformation is by constants let's promote the constants to functions and try to invent a gauge field which actually restores gauge invariance exactly the way i have described here and so many years later what they did describes the w plus the w minus the z boson and eight gluons absolute miracle they had it's safe to say that they had no clue any of these particles existed when they did their work in fact experimenters had no clue they were not discovered till much much later so maybe it's a long story and it will take you time to get used to it but somehow uh, here you need to realize that this is what quantum field theory is about it's a set of principles which are so powerful that they constrain things and they also describe nature it's like the best of both worlds we don't have to deal with bewildering variety of interactions and we don't have to deal with stuff which is too abstract and doesn't connect with nature okay and i think i've used the language before so i'll just say it once more global symmetry is when theta is constant and the vector field really doesn't care about this because in when theta is constant it doesn't even transform and this is a symmetry gauge invariance some people call it gauge symmetry but i don't care for that word is when theta is theta of x the second line is possible only if there is a gauge field to help us implement gauge symmetry sir yes and that uh, covariant derivative has something to do with covariant derivative on manifold yes covariant derivative on manifold yeah in a in a very general mathematical way it does uh, because in both cases it makes use of what is called a connection on a principal bundle but uh, so in language of fiber bundles these are similar but you can say it in physics language more easily what are we saying here if phi transforms by a phase then capital d of phi transforms by the same phase in general relativity we say if v is a vector field then covariant derivative of it is again a, a, a tensor field under uh, so any tensor field if i act with the covariant derivative it's again a tensor field okay and in both cases if i act with an ordinary derivative that property is broken okay in this case just differentiating phi with the ordinary derivative doesn't leave the phase it doesn't leave a quantity which is uh, transforms by a phase because it has that extra term in gr uh, similarly if i differentiate something like the metric just ordinary derivative of the metric that isn't a tensor i need to take covariant derivatives of tensors to get tensors so there's always a in a covariant derivative there is an ordinary derivative 
there's also what you might call a compensating term which transforms inhomogeneously. This transform on the gauge field A goes to A plus D del of theta is inhomogeneous because that extra term del mu of theta does it, is not proportional to A. So even if A was 0, after making a gauge transformation it comes back to be non-zero. So that's what we call inhomogeneous and it's that part of this transformation which cancels the derivative acting on the phase. So, so in the conceptually they are actually the same. And by the way, uh, Yang himself, who was actually my head of department in my PhD days uh, in Stony Brook, uh, often advertised the gauge principle uh, through this language, mathematical language of fiber bundles, uh, because he felt that this is the great unifying principle of nature. So actually gravity fits in with it, gauge theory fits in with it, Yang-Mills theory fits with it, and uh, even string theory fits with it. So everything that seems to be fundamental that we can think of to describe nature uh, uses this gauge principle in a deep way. Okay, good. Now, in the remaining time, there are two things I need to do, but the first one is very important. I had promised you that we would, okay, any more questions on this? Yeah. The transformation for A. Yes. You told us that uh, A has some redundant degrees of freedom. Yes, good. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for pointing this out. A has redundant degrees of freedom. So what happens when we add phi and psi in the system? Is that your question? Yes. For phi and psi, we can't. Yeah. So the, the statement, no. The statement is that the collection of A, phi and psi altogether has some redundant degrees of freedom. Same number of redundant degrees of freedom. And in some theories, you can use it to get rid of some components of A or you can use it to get rid of some phi. You can use it how you like. Hmm? There are theories where you can use this gauge freedom to get rid of some scalar field. So the rule is that everything together in this Lagrangian, this whole Lagrangian, which is the set A mu phi psi, collectively it undergoes the gauge transformation. And so something will be removed from this. But what we remove exactly is also to large extent up to us. And that is up to how we fix the gauge. And it also depends on what system we have coupled to the gauge field. It's a long story and it's very important. Uh, this idea uh, that you more or less brought up uh, is behind the Nobel Prize of Etoft and Weltman for renormalization of Yang-Mills theory. This is far in the future for us to discuss. But they actually made creative use of two different gauges to prove two different properties in the same theory. And because the theory is not supposed to depend on your choice of gauge, uh, both properties become true. And I told you this once, that in field theory, this is a game that we often can play. There are two, two ways to describe something. Both are correct, but each of them makes some property more obvious. By the way, we've already seen, and today we are going to see it again. Uh, we already saw that the Coulomb gauge reduces the vector field to two components. Uh, although they are difficult to extract, uh, because the Coulomb gauge sets A0 equals 0 and also divergence of A equals 0. So it's two constraints. One is easy to solve. It's already solved. This goes away. But this one is not something you can just solve in a local way. But it makes clear that out of three of these A's, only two are independent. Today we are going to discuss a different gauge. I hope I have the time to complete it. I think I still have 20 minutes. So today we are going to discuss the Lorentz gauge. Now before you tell me that I have left out a P in Lorentz, this Lorentz is not that Lorentz. This is a Danish Lorentz. That Lorentz transformation Lorentz is a uh, Dutch Lorentz. Uh, and interestingly, there is some result which is uh, called the Lorentz Lorentz theorem or something which has both Lorentz, though they didn't work together, but both of them independently found some result. So there are actually two Lorentzes in, in this story. There must be more also. So Lorentz gauge is a different approach and it starts by saying, well, we have four components, A mu. This attempt to fix the gauge, uh, set one of them to zero, already Lorentz invariance got sort of destroyed hmm? because A zero is one choice out of four. So we can no longer perform Lorentz transformations. 
on a vector where one component has been set to zero because it will come back to be non-zero after Lorentz transformation. So we say that this violates manifest Lorentz invariance. But the Lorentz gauge preserves manifest Lorentz invariance and this is the gauge condition del mu of a mu equals 0. The four divergence of the four vector is 0. Now, uh, it's clear that this is a Lorentz invariant condition because this quantity del mu a mu is a scalar because the mu indices have been contracted. So, it's a scalar. It's a Lorentz scalar. Okay. And it's one function made out of derivatives of all the four components of the vector field and that one we set to 0. So, clearly, this will reduce us from 4 degrees of freedom to 3. You may ask how did how do we get to 2 because that actually reduces further to 2 and we have to work that out and we will do it now. It is very interesting how it works. So, the first thing is in this gauge, we find something quite strange about the Lagrangian. Now, the Lagrangian it was easy to check and I don't know if it was an exercise, but before fixing the gauge, the Lagrangian was actually this. It was actually minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu, but if you expand out f mu nu, which has two terms and then you have four terms and then you combine them, then you get this form, exactly this. But now notice that in the Lorentz gauge, this term is gone exactly what the Lorentz gauge is saying. So, we are left with a Lagrangian that is like this. Now, uh, something little bit nightmarish is happening because now we see that this contains a 0 dot. With that term, it did not contain a 0 dot and so pi 0 was 0, but after fixing this gauge, uh, pi 0 is non-zero now pi 0 is actually minus a 0 dot. In fact, all the pi i's, pi mu's are minus a mu dot. So, there are four canonical momenta. So, it is looking quite strange because after imposing one condition, instead of losing something, we got back the thing which was not there to start with, namely the canonical momentum of a 0. Okay. But uh, we should not be afraid of this. We should work more to understand how the gauge condition works. As far as the equations of motion, well, they are as simple as you could get. They are box of A mu equals 0, which is for klein gordon equations, one for each component. Now, if you remember, we started discussing gauge theory by saying, what if we guessed this equation? Hmm. And now we have got it. But we have got it with a condition. It is not no longer just these equations, but at every stage we have to remember that del mu a mu is 0. It would be wrong to only consider these without and while forgetting that del mu a mu is 0. Hmm? So, the theory is not what I said last time. We, we guessed some theory which failed, uh, which was just the one with this equation of motion. That is still wrong, but now the theory is this equation with a constraint del mu a mu equals 0. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, now we have to start looking for residual gauge invariance. If you remember, in A0 equals 0 gauge, we realized that we have residual gauge invariance under uh, time independent gauge transformations and we use that to fix this condition. We also used an equation of motion to guarantee that if we fix this condition at one time, then it remains true for all times. So, we did a bunch of things. Now, we have to do similar bunch of things okay. for this gauge. Yes, please. Uh, to fix, uh, to get Lorentz, we have fixed some lambda. To we have not fixed, yeah, we have not fixed a lambda. We have simply said that we will, whenever we have a co configuration a mu, we will add a piece del mu lambda such that uh, del mu a mu is 0. That is said to be fixing lambda. It's, about it's fixing lambda for every gauge configuration, but it is equivalent to, see, there is no fixed gauge configuration in our minds. All possible AMUs are allowed subject to equation of motion. Now, I noticed that using the gauge freedom, I can take any of them and impose this condition. 
So now my new rule is all possible AMUs are allowed subject to equation of motion and this rule, both. So I won't actually spend my time looking for a lambda which implements this. I'll just say in the space of all functions AMU of x, I'm only going to work with those which satisfy this. Okay, and at the classical level also this. In quantum theory, we'll have to go beyond equation of motion because we'll be doing path integral, which is a different story. But at the classical level, equation of motion and constraint. Okay, now the clever thing to do at this stage to understand this gauge better is to move into momentum space. A lot of things become clearer in momentum space. And so let's do that. So in momentum space, we simply Fourier transform all the coordinates, space and time. So our field is now A mu tilde of k, and k is the four vector, Fourier conjugate to x mu. This we can always do. So now, yes. So uh, you put the constraint equation back in the Lagrangian. Yes. But uh, whenever we derive the equations of motion, yeah. that time we assume that the variations are independent, right? Yes. So, so yeah, I agree. The... No, I agree. The point is though that exactly. So in principle, well, when we do path integrals, you'll see why we are allowed to put the constraint back in the Lagrangian. But uh, what you can say is that you since we have imposed, so since our uh, our system consists of equations of motion plus the constraint del mu a mu equals zero, that system is exactly the same as the system of this equation of motion and the same constraint. Because this equation of motion and that differ by the constraint. Okay, so even here, it's not fair to say that there are four pi's because they are linked by that constraint. If I take divergence of both sides, I should get zero. Since diverge, del mu of a mu was 0, del mu of a mu dot is also 0. So del mu of pi mu is also 0. So it's not like there are four independent pi's. So I've not made independent variations. But because this is a nice and simple quadratic Lagrangian, I can just uh, do this and impose the constraint on the pi's. But anyway, I'm not going to quantize uh, canonically. That's a whole story that can be done. But I'm not going to be doing it in this course. So therefore, pi's will not play any role in my course, really. Okay. Because like usually yeah. in a constraint system, you would usually add a Lagrangian multiplier and then... Yeah, multiplier. sure. I agree. So that is why I'm not... Yeah. No, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not extracting any physical consequence from this. But I think it's still correct to say that all the solution space of this equation and the constraint is identical to the solution space of this equation and the con same constraint. So I can choose to study whichever one I want since it's the same space. Okay, momentum space. So in momentum space, what is the gauge transformation in the first place? So in position space, it was A goes to A plus del mu of lambda. But in momentum space, it is A mu of K goes to a mu uh, of k plus k mu times lambda. This lambda is also the Fourier transform of the original lambda. Lambda, theta, it doesn't matter what we call it. So it's k mu times lambda, right? This is a familiar result. Derivative of a function in position space is same thing as the conjugate momentum times the function in momentum space the standard result of Fourier transform. Okay, good. So now we can start to understand what the gauge condition means. <coughs> okay, so the gauge, Lorentz gauge says that del mu a mu equals 0. In Fourier space, this goes to k mu a mu equals 0 in mu tilde. Okay. So that means the four vector is no orthogonal in the four metric to the momentum vector. <coughs> Good. Okay. Now, what's the residual gauge invariance?
after I fix this condition, well, I can still send a mu to a mu plus k mu lambda as long as k mu times that is zero. Okay, and you see immediately that it means k mu k mu lambda is zero, which means k mu k mu itself is zero. And what is k mu k mu equals zero? It's the e equation for what sort of particle? Massless, massless particle. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it, this has told me that I'm dealing with a massless particle. So that's good. And so given that it's a massless particle, I'm actually able to make further gauge transformations of this kind without violating the Lorentz gauge. Okay, because k squared is zero. As long as I restrict my k's to those with where k squared is zero, which is the physical on-shell condition as it's called for a massless particle, then I can continue to make such transformations. So to summarize, <coughs> we have two uh, features of this gauge. One is that we have a transversality condition which says k mu on the field Fourier transform of the field is zero. The second, which is still there, is a redundancy. And somewhat surprisingly, it's still present after fixing the gauge. It only shows that we never completely fix the gauge. It's not surprising because, as you know, there have to be two conditions to get down to the physical degrees of freedom. So the redundancy is that A mu can still be sent to a mu plus k mu of lambda. And this doesn't violate the first condition because k squared is zero. Now you can start to see what is going to disentangle the physical degrees of freedom for us. First of all, this four vector is going to be uh, orthogonal to this four vector. So it will have three independent components. But now using this, I can remove one of those three components, the one which is proportional to the momentum. That component which is proportional to the momentum of the particle can be removed from it or can be varied as I like. Okay? And uh, if you think a little physically, you will see that both these conditions are going in the direction of telling me that an electromagnetic wave has only transverse polarizations which is exactly what you have been taught, but I'm pretty sure you were never given a derivation. This is a standard result in all elementary courses of physics, but there's no derivation. This is the derivation, which I haven't finished, so I'll finish it now. Okay, now the next step, for the next step, I need to think a little about the quantum theory. And as I told you, though we are not going to use canonical commutators, uh, occasionally we'll refer to them just to get some insight and I think you know that when we do that we get some decomposition of the field into oscillators which satisfy some commutations. So let's do that. So let's go back to our position space field and write it as I think is standard in QFT 1 as this and square root of omega k where omega k is actually just mod k in this case and then a mu k e to the minus i k dot x plus a mu dagger k to the i k dot x. So this is the standard way to quantize the field free field we do this and then we impose a with a dagger the commutator the usual one. Now, what are the states? So the states are, of course, there's a vacuum which is empty of particles and it's annihilated by the A's. So A on the vacuum is zero because this would uh, destroy a particle, but there weren't any particles, so it's zero. So then we have A mu K dagger on zero and these are four states. So these are four states on which we have to implement these two conditions, transvers uh, transversality and redundancy, to pull out the physical ones. So let's do that step by step. 
will only take a minute. So first let me take the full span of these four states. So let me take a vector epsilon mu and contract it with this. So this is a general linear combination of those four states and epsilon has a name, this is called a polarization vector. Okay. If it's 1, 0, 0, 0, then it's polarized in the time direction. If it's 0, 1, 0, 0, it's polarized in the x direction. If you take various epsilons, you can get every kind of polarization you want. Okay. Now, the gauge conditions say, these ones, say that k mu on a dagger mu k on 0 should be 0. Because k mu on the Fourier transform of the field, which is everything in here, uh, is 0. Okay. But it also says that the state a mu k dagger on 0 is the same as the state a mu k on 0 plus k mu lambda k times 0. Okay, so it can be shifted by k mu. So this is the one, the first one is the transversality, second one is the redundancy. Hmm? That's meant to be the Fourier transform of lambda. Good. Okay, now we want to solve these conditions and now comes a beautiful thing that we can choose the Lorentz frame appropriately to solve them. This is a massless particle. So its forward momentum is null, k mu k mu is zero. So I'll choose k mu to be one, zero, zero, one. And there can be a number in front. Sir? Yes. How lambda k is an operator tilde? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is maybe not a very convenient way of, uh, a clear way of putting it. Let, let me go on and I'll come back to this question. Okay. So the first condition, this in this, okay, so this you agree, right? And now I have to also make k upper mu, which has a slight change of sign. It's 1, 0, 0, minus 1, because of the metric which raised this component and made it minus. Okay, so k is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So what does the first equation say in this? It says that A0 dagger on the vacuum is the same as A3 dagger on the vacuum. In this frame, this is the solution. The second condition says that epsilon mu k mu equals zero. Basically what it says is that, okay, so I think better thing to say is this k mu on anything, any state. If I shift this by a state which is proportional to the vector k mu, then uh, I'm, I'm just allowed to do that, okay? And so if I impose, and if I make this gate choice, then I have epsilon mu k mu equals zero. So epsilon mu a mu was the set of states. And what I'm saying is that if a mu is on zero is replaced by k mu on some state, then this should vanish because this is my freedom. So epsilon dot k is zero. So if I solve that, then I find that um, this in my, in my choice, it gives me epsilon zero plus epsilon three is equal to zero hmm? because k has components only along one and three. Yes. This is this something you're imposing, right? Yes. It's a, it's part, it's imposing the redundancy part. So the, the, uh, the transversality was imposed by this condition, which said these two states are the same. And the redundancy is imposed by saying that this polarization vector is uh, dotted with the momentum is zero. Okay. And then the state that we are considering turns into, this implies, um, so epsilon 0 plus epsilon 3 equals 0. So the state epsilon 0 a mu dagger on 0 has the components epsilon 0 a 0 dagger on 0. This is the first term. Then there's a term minus epsilon uh, 0 a 3 dagger on 0. Okay, because epsilon 3 is minus of epsilon 0. And then plus two more terms, epsilon 1 a 1 dagger 
and epsilon 2 a2 dagger okay but i already decided that these two are the same state <coughs> so this difference between a0 and a3 is zero so this is gone so now you can see clearly that two out of the four terms in epsilon mu a mu are gone okay one because of this condition which equated two things and the other because of this condition which said that they actually are, uh, arise with equal and opposite signs so they are gone and we are left with a1 and a2 now what are a1 and a2 what are these states of the particle with momentum along the z direction these are the x and y components of the field so this is the end of the proof we have proved that the field has only components transverse to its own direction of motion and these are the ones and that they are exactly two now i can choose epsilon one or epsilon two to be one and the other one zero then i'll get the x and the y if i choose both i can make circular or any other polarization but always transverse to the plane of motion and you can go through this calculation again more carefully of course you can always do this in a general frame but it's just more complicated whatever frame you pick you can choose k to be arbitrary you will simply get at the end that the components that certain components will cancel and two components which are transverse to the direction of k will survive so it's a frame independent statement even though we did it in a particular frame okay so i'll stop here and tomorrow we'll talk about the angles are there any questions yes the momentum space constraint was like k mu k mu equal to 0 yeah k mu k mu equals 0 is the constraint under which i can still make gauge transformations right so if you look at that in normal space we see we find that it's like box lambda equal to 0 yeah which is in fact the klein gordon equation for a massless particle can we think of that as lambda being coupled to you can think of it as lambda being a massless particle which is subtracted from the theory because it, it gives you a redundancy in the theory. Mm -hmm. So the lambda which we think of normally as just a parameter which depends on x. You can also think of it as a field for a particle which because of the redundancy is removed from the system. Because in that case his doubt can kind of be resolved because oh. lambda can be thought of as the creation yes exactly the exactly but it doesn't matter for my purposes because i really don't care what is this state as long as the thing multiplying it is k mu but you're quite right so that lambda i had written earlier could be thought of as the modes of a scalar field which is not a physical field but a field that i can use to remove degrees of freedom because it's the field of the gauge parameter and by the way this is not a just a coincidence a lot of modern field theory relies on the fact that a gauge parameter and a field are sort of the same thing but with different meanings. A field when you quantize gives you a particle. A gauge parameter isn't a particle but it can be somehow the absence of a particle or in some other theories it could also become a particle. We'll see some examples. So it's, it's actually field theory is full of these things where we don't know what are the particles till we have done some calculation. For example, in gauge theory, without knowing all this, we would think that the vector field creates four particles or a particle with four polarizations. But after doing all this, we clearly see that there are two and that in a Lorentz invariant gauge, they are exactly the ones transverse to the direction of motion. No longitudinal wave in light, which is an experimental fact. And it's amazing that this formalism reveals a very deep truth about nature and also that it only works for the massless particle. Everything fits nicely. When you have massive waves, they do in fact have longitudinal modes. We may discuss that briefly tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop here then.